Hello, uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to the second Elevate IT TOLA Technology Summit. Uh, we hope that uh, you've had a great time thus far and listened to a lot of the speakers here in the VIP theater. I'm honored to be a part of that. My name is George Crawford. I work for a company called Catapult Energy Services. We're a private equity backed company. We have uh, five companies that I'm in charge of, uh, being a, a CIO and a CISO. So I'm going to be telling you a little bit about that and going through some of the different um, things that I want to communicate to you today. And uh, if you uh, read the abstract, you'll see that it was about uh, people, processes, and technology, more specifically um, about what that means and what can you do with that and what the implications are with that from a change management perspective, whether it's a merger and acquisition or what that might be. So a little bit about my background and the experience I've had. I started in 91 with Arthur Anderson after I graduated from U of H with an MIS degree. Started with Arthur Anderson in their consulting group. And the biggest lesson I learned from Arthur Anderson is make sure that the customer perceives that you're doing a great job. Make sure that they believe in what you're doing and they have confidence in you. Then they will feel secure and they'll want you back. So that's the biggest thing that I learned from the consulting group. That and that uh, give me 30 minutes and I'll be an expert at anything because you got staffed on different projects where you knew absolutely nothing but had to perform and instill confidence in the customers. After that, I, I went to Allied Waste. I was the uh, IT director for Allied Waste. That was where I learned a big lesson, one of my first ones. I'd always wanted a seat at the table uh, with the board and with the C-suite. So uh, as that position, I went into the first board meeting and um, I don't know how many people are familiar with the three second glaze. I've uh, spoken of that before. The three second glaze, right? So I went into the board meeting and sat down and we were talking about different things. Then they asked me about um, technology and I started to present technology and I was talking about bits and bytes and how we're gonna secure them and do different things. Well, the three second glaze uh, happens when you go in and you talk about technology and you're not communicating to them and they glaze over within three seconds and they start working on their phones or other things. And that's really generous because there's probably 1.5 seconds. And so that's the importance of being able to communicate. And the lesson that I learned there is when you're speaking to the board or the C-suite, you speak their language. You never speak up or down to anyone. You always speak to people. So when you speak to the board, you speak about risk mitigation, you speak about operating leverage, you speak about EBITDA increase, and you speak about those types of things that interests them. And then you correlate and you associate technology to that through the business side of it, which I'll get into in a little bit. Well, from there, I started my own technology company uh, in, I guess it was 95. Built that for about 10 years, sold to private equity. That's how I got into private equity. Uh, then uh, joined a, another private equity group and did a platform company where we did 13 mergers and acquisitions. I laid waste. I think we did about 18 mergers and acquisitions. I didn't really have much to do with the due diligence process then, but I did do all the integration of those companies. Uh, that's where people, processes, and technology come into play. I learned the importance of uh, what you do when you go in and the alignment of culture when you do mergers and acquisitions, that how quickly they can fall apart. And you can look at, uh, for instance, Continental and United and how that merger went. It, it wasn't very successful. Um, and they had, it was almost like a line drawn down the middle. You could tell culture uh, by the person you were talking to. And they were very diverse. So that's a trick uh, when you talk about people, process, and technology, mergers and acquisitions, the culture side of things is, is extremely important and the alignment that you try to create in organizations, which we'll talk more about in a little bit. So from that, I went into where I am now, Catapult Energy Services. We have uh, five companies uh, that's all in oil field services. So a little bit of a redheaded stepchild right now on Wall Street. So I'm responsible for the five companies as a CIO and CISO. So I'm in charge of everything IT, OT, and cyber. So just and DevOps, everything else associated with those five companies. We are recently did a merger and acquisition. So we're going through that process right now. I'm in charge of the integration of that company as well as participate in the due diligence. So it's always fun to see how other people are doing things and then you can create the best of both worlds and cultures. 
But anyway, so as CIO and CISO of these five companies, uh, we have a very diverse environment. We have everything from the, from the IT standpoint, so you have all of the, of the basic things that you're having to do regarding um, your infrastructure and your, um, all the different aspects associated with that, DevOps. We have an application that they've been developing for a while, so we have a, a development crew that's over that. Then we have our OT, which is all of the different uh, SCADA devices and SCADA environments that we have external uh, out in the operations. That's uh, a challenge. We're going to talk a little bit about that in the SCADA environment and about the cyber related to that as well as cyber related to the regular environments. So a lot of the things um, in the presentation today, the, the main thing that I want you to be able to take away is when, when you're a technologist and you come in and uh, people look at technology and they go, oh, well, you know, it's interesting because you don't seem like someone in technology because you can actually carry on a conversation. So that's kind of the old regime and the old perspective on uh, technology and people in technology. And there are still some people that prefer to be very much into technology that um, aren't very good from an outgoing perspective and maybe more of an introvert type of personality. But more and more in uh, um, technology, the things that are really, really important is that communication, to be able to communicate to the other areas within a business. Um, one of the things that when um, I was put up for uh, CIO of the Year through uh, the Orby Awards, one of the things they wanted to understand was what's your philosophy on technology and, uh, and as a CIO, what's the thing that you should really know? And, and what I put down was as a CIO, you need to know that being a CIO isn't about technology. It's about business. And what can uh, you do with that business? The more you understand the business, the more business acumen you have, the more that you communicate with other leaders within that business, the more you understand where the issues are and where the pain points are within that business. And from there, then you can come up with solutions leveraging technology or more specifically people, processes, and technology to make that company better, to transform it, to create innovation within that company. And that's what uh, technology is all about. It's not about the technology, it's about the business and creating something even greater than you could have had before by leveraging that technology. So I'll give you a quick example, um, which covers the, one of the different bullets in the abstract, which is increasing overall business value through innovation and adaptability. It was with our coil tubing company. And the reason that we were able to do this project was because of the relationship that we had with the board and the communication style that we used. When we went in and we talked to them about uh, this new project, it was a fairly expensive project. And when we went to them, we talked to them about the, the business value, which was increasing the overall uh, competitive advantage uh, barrier to entry, as well as uh, increase uh, multiple on exit, meaning that uh, most companies, when you do a merger and acquisition, you base it off of EBITDA, which is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, amortization, fancy word. And so you typically, within the private equity world, you get a certain multiple on that based on the industry you're in and, and the solidity of the revenue and the revenue stream and things of that nature. So anyway, so we told them we would get a higher multiple uh, on the company as well if we did this project that uh, we were suggesting. So we talked in their language, they uh, understood, they appreciated it, they gave us a green light. So we went ahead and went forward with the project and it had to do, it was a very technical project. It had to do with uh, SCADA and SCADA environments and data, data analytics and artificial intelligence associated with uh, uh, adapting to the information and being able to make uh, very quick decisions in the field based on data that we were accumulating to that point that would give us um, information to be able to make more informed decisions. Uh, but it also provided something that was really valuable for our customer base. We had one really large customer, Tier 1, everyone would know the company if I, if I could tell you what it was. They were having issues because they wanted more and more data because they wanted to be able to do data analytics associated with the milling process and that's what a coal tubing company does. Long story short, what we did was we worked with them, we understood what they wanted and we created um, a virtual environment for them that allowed them to be there and be on site to stream data real time to them uh, 
uh, from all of the different SCADA uh, collection points, and there's quite a few. Um, so that's a very technical thing, right? But the way we presented it to the board was that it was business value and uh, allowed us for some type of com competitive advantage. So we went through this project and worked on it and implemented it out in the field. It was very successful. This large tier one um, oil and gas company uh, really appreciated it. We, got, we went from being third call, which means that we were the third call for our coal tubing units to first call. And so that increased our revenue. The board, of course, we immediately notified the board about how successful this project was going, that we were getting additional revenue from them, we were getting additional exposure. So when it came time to monetize the company, what we were able to do was this software that we created and this solution that we created that basically provided, as I said, an overall simulation and uh, the virtual reality of the, the actual process going on out in the field. And we showed them how closely we were aligning to the different um, simulated aspects that they, um, that they wanted to, that how it should have gone and how closely we were aligned to that. We we're the only company that could do it. As a result, when we went to monetize the company, we had different groups that were very interested in us that did similar um, work, but they didn't have this tool. They didn't have that differentiator. And that was one of the reasons uh, that we were told that the company bought um, our coil tubing company. So all of the things that we told the board uh, pretty much came true. We increased our revenue, uh, we created competitive advantage, and we did some things where we increased the multiple uh, on exit. So they got more of a multiple based on this solution because it was something that they wanted to buy because it was something that was unique and they wanted it. Long story short, we built credibility with the board and whenever you can, uh, and a lot of people call it within technology, uh, I'll credit one of my colleagues that says this all the time, it's What's your say-do ratio? Um, how often do you say something and, and that you actually do it? And the more that you say something, the more that you do it, the more reliable that you are and the more confidence that you instill in those people around you and the more they trust you. So that brings us back full circle to the overall topic, which is what are the challenges that the CIO and CISOs face in uh, the arrest of 2020 and going into 2021? Well, there's a lot of challenges that we're going to face, obviously. Um, um, some of them we're not real sure about because of COVID and because of the election coming up and other things that may affect what we're going to do. But speaking of COVID, that was one of the big issues, obviously, that, uh, that we had to deal with. Normally, it takes us quite a bit of time to get something through the board or through the C-suite or to talk about change and some of the different things, especially in uh, my group, which is oil field services. So it's traditionally a very slow to adopt change. But with COVID and with, for instance, the need to be able to have all of our people working off site and no longer in the office, that gave us uh, something to be able to leverage from a perspective of speed to market. So we were able to affect change uh, literally overnight and the board bought into that, they didn't really have a choice. And so that really helped us drive that change. And it's actually helping us continue to drive that change within our companies because we don't have the luxury of time anymore. A lot of things have to happen overnight. For instance, uh, with the downturn in the economy, we just acquired the company, as I mentioned earlier, and with a normal 100-day plan for mergers and acquisitions, we actually condensed that down to a 30-day plan. So within 30 days, we had to adopt uh, and merge all of their systems. We had to bring them in and understand what their risk profile was from a cyber perspective and shore all of that up. Uh, they also had a data center that was totally physical, so we had to go virtual on that. We had to incorporate that uh, from a DR perspective into ours. We also had to integrate the ERP systems so all of these things, uh, you don't get a larger staff, unfortunately, but you do have the opportunity to get speed to market and with a lot more awareness from the board and the C-suite, which is great because uh, once you accomplish those things and they see the speed to market, and I keep saying speed to market, but speed to our internal stakeholders and uh, being able to do that in such a short period of time, that uh, gave us the opportunity to continue. 
So as I was mentioning, a lot of the changes that we have um, working from home and, and having those things that just happened actually um, occur during your videos and your presentations. But anyway, so the, that, uh, the speed to accomplish certain things and to be able to move into the uh, change environment where normally it would take a lot more convincing and a lot more uh, of the operations people buying into it and that's typically where a lot of your holdup is in oilfield services. So we're able to accomplish a lot more things in a lot less time and once you do that successfully again and, and the way you communicate it to the board and the C-suite and the way you communicate to operations and different business functional silos within your organization, it, it really provides a lot more of uh, a camaraderie that we have and when you work with them that closely you build that rapport and that relationship. So although uh, you know the, the travesty associated with COVID uh, to our society and to uh, people's lives and other things, there, there are other things that have happened and occurred to that that provided opportunity with, within the technology sector and especially within the traditional, as I say, uh, things that used to take quite a while to implement from a change perspective and, and getting buy-in throughout the organization where you get buy-in overnight. So that was one of the big changes associated with that. Uh, what are the other topics associated with uh, with what we were talking about here is, again, going back to the communication side of things, which is one of the things I've learned over time with the different positions I'm in. And this will apply to everyone, whether you're um, in uh, a developer or whether you're in a help desk position, level one, level two, level three, or whatever that role is that you're playing, or obviously CIOs and VPs of, of IT is the, the camaraderie and the understanding that we have with other business leaders within our organization. To be able to establish that rapport and the communication and be able to speak their language, once you get that business acumen, understand that uh, being a CIO or a CTO or um, a, even, even a CISO, the, the business side of it is very, very important. A CISO is worried about the risk portfolio. He has to communicate that to the board. Uh, we're worried about, uh, as a CISO, you're, you're worried about all different environments from OT to IT to DevOps to your third-party vendors and the exposure and risk that you have there. But being able to um, communicate with the board at that level now, or you have a better rapport, better uh, relationship, and help them understand the risk profile. And it's not always doom and gloom with cyber. Uh, there are actually competitive advantages that you can acquire with cyber. And when you help the board understand that, for instance, if you're a, a B2C organization and you have your clientele that's concerned about uh, the privacy and GDPR and other things and they want to make sure their information is kept very secure, uh, the statistics and studies show that they're willing to pay anywhere from a 5 to a 7% premium over and above commodity, the pricing on commodity day items to ensure that their information is safe. And so when you can prove that you have this cyber and this, uh, the, your privacy in place, and all your encryption at rest and, and all the other things that you would think of from something that would keep people's data and information secure. Once you do that, you actually create a competitive advantage. So when you communicate to the board and tell them this is a, a competitive advantage, we can get additional revenue in the door because we have a great cyber um, environment and you have a low risk portfolio or profile. And once you start establishing that, now you're starting to become, they're starting to look at you not so much as a cost center, but a revenue center. Once you have the board looking at technology and IT as a revenue center, understanding how that can be a business enabler and, and promote our business through innovation, through transformation, through the different things, competitive advantages that we've talked about before. Once you start communicating that way, then, then you've kind of won the game and, and you have a lot more ability and a lot more money and a lot more sway with the board to be able to get a lot of the things accomplished that in the past we typically have not. So that's a huge advantage. But one of the things I want to make sure I share, um, and a lot of the things that I do and a lot of the boards I sit on, a lot of the different educational groups that I, I'm a part of, um, and curriculum committees and all the different things that we do, I mentor a lot of people. And when I mentor the people, uh, there are several things that we help them with, which Again, one of them revolves around the communication, being able to communicate, establish rapport, and talk to people to where they have a confidence and they're comfortable, where they'll actually share some of the things that are hurdles for them, what keeps them up at night. That's when you really start winning. That's when you can start applying solutions using people, processes, and technology to help them in what they're trying to accomplish. 
So uh, one of the other things that uh, I want to bring up, because I know with the, both with the um, Elevate IT and with TOLA group um, associated with this, there's all different levels of technologists within this group that's, um, that's watching this video right now. One of the important things that, that I'd like to help people understand, which is part of TOLA and, and Elevate IT and uh, some of the different organizations that I, that I participate in, whether that's um, SIM or Houston CIO or ISOC or any of those groups, uh, it's really, really important to, to network, to establish that network, because that's, again, in the communication and the rapport that you establish with other people. Once you start establishing that and you have this ability to be able to network with these other groups, that really gives you a lot of insight into when you're uh, talking about a project that you have and three of your friends have already been through that, then you have the benefit of the, of the you know, hard knocks that they've been through and the trials and tribulations of the implementation of the selection process, of the implementation process, of the gotchas after you do the implementation. Those are invaluable. And the way that you establish the, the ability to communicate with other people that do that is through networking. And, the old adage, which is very, very true, and I would encourage everyone to get into networking and, and start giving back to the community, which is an important part of being a well-rounded CAO from my perspective. But being able to um, work with other people and work uh, through that network, the, the old adage is you don't really need to network until you need to network. And then if you wait until you need to network, you're too late to network. So um, one of the things I would encourage everyone to do is, is network and to be well-rounded in what they do. And then also in the community involvement I was mentioning, to be able to mentor um, students, whether they're high school students, I do that through Genesis Works, and if that's through college or young professionals or anyone at, at any level, to be able to provide that uh, feedback and the mentorship and mutual mentorships where you meet with someone that, uh, that you respect and the two of you can help each other uh, along your course and make sure that you're doing everything that you should be doing with that objectivity and the, and the ability for that mentor to be able to do that. So those are some of the things uh, that from the communication, networking, and um, the rapport establishment that you do with different people. So that's something I've learned over time that's really, really important and uh, something that if you get really good at, whether um, you're of whatever level of technologist that you are, those are invaluable. So some of the other things that, that we were going to talk about, one of the different things or, or one of the things would be in the SCADA environment and leveraging AI and, and the cyber side of things within that. So. Uh, the different things that we have going on right now from a SCADA perspective, the, the threat landscape associated with SCADA environments obviously is very high. It's one of the top items that InfraGuard is concerned about and, and where they're paying a lot of their attention within the SCADA environment infrastructure and things of that nature. Well, when uh, my personal experience with that is when we have our, all of our equipment out there in the field, and we have the ability to do certain things within that from a cyber perspective to keep it safe and to keep it as, as safe as you can. Where uh, 10, 15 years ago, all these system uh, control networks were all isolated. They were all off by themselves. And so by, by that nature, they were pretty secure, right? There wasn't any way for anyone to access it uh, because it was totally isolated, totally closed system. And it wasn't, uh, it wasn't crossed over with any of the other networks or anything else. So that made it relatively safe. Well, now everyone wants to combine that network with their production network or with some other way or to be able to access it with, for data to be able to move in. And, and there's a lot of ways that you, can, that you can do that, that you can make that information available uh, without uh, violating or introducing risk into the equation or, or uh, with at least uh, an acceptable amount of risk. So some of the things that we're doing right now, uh, I don't know how many people have heard of the zero trust environment. Basically, it's where any device on the network is not trusted. So each one has to authenticate and has to have a explicit permission to be able to to gain access to that network to be able to transmit or broadcast within that environment. So those zero trust environments, um, there's a lot more to it obviously, but that's a real high level general um, overview associated with what uh, you know, the zero trust environment would be. We've implemented that in several of our different SCADA environments and networks where it's particularly sensitive. 
There are other things that you can do as well to protect that are basic blocking and tackling within a SCADA and control system environment. One of those things leverages a tool, uh, for instance, like Dark Trace, which is an, an AI-driven tool that creates a baseline of data that's transmitted from that device, how that device acts on the network, uh, different ways that, uh, or things it would try to access and creates that baseline of behavior and characteristics. And then once you have a delta from that, uh, then it triggers things that will do any number of things all the way down to shutting that device down uh, because it, it could be compromised. And so for instance, a, a great example of that would be uh, the that happened in Vegas at one of the casinos. It's a fairly famous story associated with uh, a fish tank. And in their infinite wisdom, what they did was they wanted to be able to have the temperature monitored and be able to access that temperature over their internet and over their uh, Wi-Fi. So what they've done is they've introduced something which uh, is something that we'll get into in a second associated with the internet of things and, and the threat vectors associated with that. But this particular instance, um, they allowed that uh, fish tank to be able to gain access to the network for the temperature control. And what ultimately happened is someone hacked into that and w was able to gain access to uh, different areas within their network of sensitive data and uh, different things within that casino that they didn't want people accessing. Obviously, it was a very secure environment. So because they introduced that within that environment, if they had something like a dark trace or something that would create a baseline of activity, it would immediately trigger that and it would have shut down. So that's the purpose behind that. Uh, and it's becoming more and more prevalent within different control environments as well as within you know, regular production environments as well, because it, it, the, as more and more things through the Internet of Things are, are being introduced into our networks and as they proliferate, which they are very rapidly, as there are, you know, billions of, I don't, I don't know what the exact number is now, but, uh, you know, tens of billions of different IoT devices out there. And uh, so the result of that is that there's more and more threat vectors coming in that we need to address and understand how we're going to mitigate that risk. So there are, you know, the, the zero trust environment is one of the ways that we can do that, where um, if these IoT devices aren't trusted devices on the network, they won't gain access to it. Uh, so that's a way to, to keep the ones out. But there are uh, different IoT devices that we're going to want to connect into our environment. So the, the dark trace or the, the AI driven uh, things with the baseline is another good way to do it. Uh, because that will help us understand uh, if there are uh, different things that are going on that we want to prevent. So uh, those different environments are really important and key to be able to, as we go forward and as more and more Internet of Things uh, and those devices are being connected to our environment, to be able to control and mitigate the risk associated with that. So the other thing that we had mentioned earlier that we uh, will probably want to uh, expand on a little bit, which are uh, people, processes, and technology. And what does that mean associated to the CIO and the CISOs in, in today's world and moving into 2021? So a, a lot of the things that, it, that we've heard right now through the COVID and all the changing times are that there, there is a lot of change going on within business and as a result within technology as well. So one of the things that, as you talk about people, process, and technology, those are, those are things that you combine and use as a CIO to be able to streamline uh, business processes, to be able to create efficiencies in organizations, uh, which when you create those efficiencies, you theoretically can do things uh, less expensively, increasing your operating leverage, which means more money goes to the bottom line. So these are all things uh, that are not necessarily project driven, but more along the lines of how do we create efficiency in our organization? So a lot of that comes from when we talk about the people, process and technology, which was actually the theme associated with my technology company back in 95 to 2005, was a, a lot of the things that we did dealt with uh, business process improvement and understanding what that is. And uh, a lot of that stems from what some of you might be familiar with, which would be you, you understand what the process is, which is an as-is process, which is how things are currently done. And then you get to go and understand 
and create the to be process. How do you want it to be? How do you want it to go? A lot of these business process improvements are done in departmental silos uh, within an organization or within functional silos within organizations uh, at a departmental level. But uh, some are done organizational wide, organizationally wide. And, and those are what we call horizontal business processes, the ones that transcend all the functional boundaries within a company and, and goes from the very beginning to the very end of what the company does. So the full life cycle of that. So those are, are things that, uh, when you get into it, uh, involve a lot of different characteristics of change that we had talked about. And we all know that people uh, in, their, in the element within business, a lot of, or within their personal lives as well, they, they're not too keen on change. And a lot of the, the old adage that people used to say is, hey, change is great as long as it doesn't affect me. So how do we get into that environment uh, as a CIO and a CISO? Because that's a large part of our, our or things that we need to accomplish within businesses, streamlining business and efficiencies. There's the big items, things that create innovation and uh, transformation within the business. But there's also those uh, singles that we hit on a regular basis within departments and again within functional silos that are the business process improvements. So that, that's a big part and a big challenge because those are really changing right now for our organizations. So how fast can we keep up with that to, to change a process? Because typically when you change a process within an organization, uh, it, it involves change of the individual, the employees that are performing that function. It requires a change within uh, typically the, whether it's technology or software or whatever else that is to implement the change and within a policy and procedures that you have or st standard operating procedures within an organization. So all those things uh, work together to be um, if more efficient as you go and you streamline these different things from a to be to an as is process modeling. So those are some of the things that um, when we talk about people, process, and technology, again, we, we say that a lot, but those are the three main elements to business process improvement. And uh, then you also talk about the, the change aspects and the pyramid of resistance, which is basically why are individuals resistant to the change? How do you overcome that resistance? And a lot of that's through involving them in that process and helping them understand why that you're doing these improvements and the changes that are affecting them. Uh, when, they, when they do that, they gain buy-in into that process change and they can actually um, help facilitate that change. And a lot of times what you do um, when we talk about business process improvement when you do the, the, the horizontal process improvement, which is basically the, to streamline something that runs through the entire organization, it touches a lot of different uh, functional silos within organizations, such as finance, uh, accounting, um, and sales, and execution, and operations, and all the different aspects within an organization and those things. So one of the things that's always proved very valuable in that is when, when you do that and you transcend those functional boundaries, there's touch points within. So you have uh, typically a group of individuals from each of those functional silos come in and you talk about how things are currently done. These are the people that actually do the work because they're very familiar with the process and, and how it actually works within the organization. So once you understand what those are, then then you help them understand the the uh, how to work together to talk about the process. And what inevitably happens is awareness from one functional silo to another that uh, that's how the process works. A lot of times they don't know what happens once it leaves their area of expertise, but once they start understanding that, that's when you really get into some opportunities for change and for process improvement. Inevitably, what you find is um, a lot of times one group will uh, create this report that takes them, you know, hours every day to generate uh, because that's the report that needs to be handed off to the other divisions. And as you go through this process, uh, you'll find that they'll go, oh, well, actually, we haven't used that report in three years. So uh, but yet we've been producing it uh, every day for the last three years. So that awareness and that understanding of the entire process as it flows through the organization is invaluable. So those business process and incremental improvements that we do within the organization is also a big part uh, of that. And then the challenge that we face right now going into uh, 2021, because so many things are changing so fast. And so it's really how do you keep up with it? 
So that's one of the challenges that we have um, from a CIO and, and CISO perspective. So uh, obviously with uh, Elevate IT uh, putting on this, this conference, this technology summit, a lot of it has to do uh, with security as well and uh, risk mitigation associated with that security. Well, um, I happen to be associated with a group called Cyber Houston, and it is a, an ISAL, which is basically information sharing and analysis organization. And what, what uh, the charge is, and, and a good friend of mine, Imesh, uh, started this a while back, and I, I am privileged to serve on the council associated with that. But our responsibility is bringing awareness of cybersecurity to, to our community, to Houston, and to businesses, and to the boards, and to the C-suite, and helping people understand what their responsibilities are, what the risks are associated with it, and what the regulations are, and, and what they need to do to ensure that they're doing the right things for their organization. It's, it's really a great thing, and, and it's been really rewarding. I've talked to a lot of different boards and helped them understand the, what it means to come in and understand uh, cyber and their cyber risk within the organization. Work with a lot of different CIOs and, and helping them to um, on the main talking points. We've also created some different documents of, of how you communicate with the board and the C-suite regarding uh, cybersecurity. So it's been really rewarding. And one of the things that has come out of that is a lot of people don't know what their risk exposure is. A lot of people don't know how to qualify it. They don't know how to get started. So uh, one of the things that is really valuable with that is we do have several different documents that uh, will allow you to assess your cybersecurity uh, proficiency in an organization to allow you to understand what are the key points and where are the weaknesses and what do we need to address. So uh, I've also, and again, had the opportunity to go in and talk to different boards about wh what are they required to do, and both from you know, their organization and also from a protection for them and their organization to ensure they're doing the right things to be able to, um, if they ever get, um, you know, into an issue and someone goes, well, what are you doing to, uh, or what did you do to, to mitigate your risk and take your responsibility and be informed in the role that you have? Uh, a lot of people seeing uh, the different things on C-SPAN with the, the different companies that have had breaches and the the senate hearings that they have that are going on and they're asking them questions and some of them are quite embarrassing from the organizational standpoint because they're saying well you know we weren't we didn't know that we needed to do that and that's so that's a lot of the reason that cyber houston exists in the different uh, education and the different material that uh, cyber houston produces and there's a lot of individuals on, on the Cyber Houston uh, Council uh, that have a tremendous amount of experience, a lot more than I do. They have, you know, 15, 20, 30 years worth of, of cyber experience and, and understanding. And they've been working in that realm for so long. Uh, and I, I have learned a tremendous amount from them. And uh, so some of the things that we try to help organizations understand is that there's a, a matrix of risk associated with data. And, and again, some people call that, you know, there, there are crown jewels there that we need to make sure that no one penetrates. And the, the more you do that and, and the more that you have to put um, that um, impenetrable thing around something, the more expensive it is and you can't do it around everything. So you, you have your, your matrix of risk that you do and then you understand which are the elements that we need to protect and at what level. And uh, you're always going to do basic blocking and tackling in an environment, you're, um, whether that's within an email environment, which you know obviously is the biggest threat vector to be able to get compromised from an individual perspective. But um, a lot of times that's you know ransomware or that's um, other things. And there's so many different tools out there now for ransomware and, and so many different processes that you can use to mitigate that risk um, or the, the social engineering that people are doing to be able to gain access to environments, to be able to convince someone to click on something or to become their friends on social media and then, or the, all the spear phishing and all the different things. But we have tools for that too, to um, you know put things in place to where we can coach individuals within. So there's all things that you can do within an environment to be able to mitigate that risk and the threat vectors that come in. 
but it, but it's uh, you can't do a hundred percent in everything. You just don't have that, or most people don't have that kind of a budget. So you have to be strategic in that. Those are some of the different things um, that Cyber Houston does. They have a cyber preparedness uh, tool and other things that will really help people understand how to start assessing their environment and how to um, apply the funds in the different areas that are most critical and how to ensure that you do some of the different, uh, you know, 80, 90% blocking and tackling within other environments. So, uh, and again, that's, that's a great um, a tool that's available to everyone. So one of the questions that's come up is um, when you're uh, in technology, what are some of the best ways uh, you had mentioned, I had mentioned earlier that networking is, is a very important part of what we need to do. And so how do you get started? Uh, and that was a great question. So the way you get started is by um, getting started, taking that first step. So there's a lot of different groups out there, um, obviously Elevate IT and uh, the different groups um, associated with this environment uh, or, or the technology summit that's going on right now. Um, there, there's a lot of groups out there and those groups, um, there's a lot of value and benefit from the networking side, not just meeting other people and expanding your network and, and interfacing with people and gaining more knowledge in what they're doing and how that applies to your environment, but it also gives you opportunities to participate in the community and to be able to expand your network. I've, uh, since I've been joining some of these different groups over the last 10 years, I've been able to gain um, access into a lot of different things in the community to be able to help different organizations. Uh, I sit on the board for um, HBU, for Lone Star College, for U of H, um, on curriculum committees for NSF and for other groups and, and Cyber Houston as I mentioned a minute ago but um, a lot of different groups in Houston are available to you and the main thing is um, joining and then getting involved and not just going to meetings but um, introducing yourself trying to pick one person a week that you're gonna um, have lunch with or talk to and get to know that individual and, and do that on a regular basis that allows you to then and, and it, gain access to a larger and larger network because you know six degrees of separation so when you meet someone they're going to introduce you to someone else that thinks it's important for you to know them and uh, that that's really key to be able to expand your network and it, and it takes quite a while it takes several years to create a good network within the Houston area and, and beyond so the the sooner you get started the better so that's the advice that I would give you um, that are that are beginning to network is just get started, get in, get involved, um, find out how you volunteer within that group, and then also the opportunities for being able to mentor others to, um, through that organization. Uh, we have lots of opportunities to be able to mentor other people, to be able to get involved in communities, in, in education, in so many different areas uh, within the incubators and the different relationships we have with them. So those are all great ways for you to get out and start networking and, and participating in that. And I, I promise you that you won't regret it. It's one of the most important things that you can do to advance your career and to be able to have more opportunities. So as we start to wrap up and, and summarize, um, I know that there's a lot of different topics that we've covered today. And the, that was kind of by design that uh, I was asked that uh, there's quite a diverse um, audience that we have out there today and uh, for the VFE theater. So they really wanted us to be able to try to bring something of value to each and every one of the individuals out there. So hopefully you have some questions regarding some of the different things that we've discussed. And anything that, uh, that I can do, I'm on LinkedIn, George Crawford. I'm happy to link in with people and uh, to share my network with them. So, uh, but um, I'm going to go ahead and, and conclude here. And then hopefully we'll have some questions and answers. And I appreciate everyone's time. And thank you, um, uh, Elevate IT and TOLA and uh, for this technology summit. Uh, we need these to be able to get exposure to uh, a lot of the different topics that are going on right now, a lot of the different changes, because it, it does change rapidly in the technology environment. Also an opportunity to all the vendors uh, that supported this conference and uh, that have become a part of it. Uh, vendors are our number one source of information and expertise, subject matter ex expertise associated with uh, their areas. 
Uh, I leverage and I have great vendor partners that, um, that I work with on a regular basis and that I continually keep in touch with because, again, they're uh, our best source of information and, and subject matter experts. So uh, go around and make sure you um, uh, introduce yourself uh, when the opportunity arises. I know what, right now we're not getting much out into a social environment, but um, via LinkedIn, via other things, and thank the, the vendors that have participated and reach out to them, and uh, they're going to be a great source of information for you. So. Again, thank you and I look forward to any questions.